Welcome back to that Milan podcast. Martino Puccio, Matt Santangelo here with you guys. Appreciate all of you. Please subscribe to the podcast, that Milan podcast. Follow us on Twitter at that Milan pod. We keep on getting more and more listens. Last week's episode with Kush, if you did not watch it, was phenomenal. It did really well, uh, including all three of us in terms of getting this prediction right for Milan Fiorentina. But before we get into that, Matt, how are you? Chugging along. Work. It's kind of work, you know, you know the vibes. And um, yeah, no, Milan keep getting results. We'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah, um, really strong form for Milan in 2024. Uh, not much disappointment, but then again, the derby is around the corner. Um, first and foremost, we just have to thank Kush once again for coming on. It was a great episode mm-hmm. with him. He used a clip where we all had the same prediction of two to one. And it ended up really being that sort of match where, in instances, it was difficult for Milan, although I think they should have scored three to four goals within this one. Um mm-hmm. Obviously, I think Leao was kind of vintage in this. Uh, we saw how well Chukwese was playing once again. I think that was probably the biggest takeaway from it. Again, if you wanted more of my thoughts on this game, you guys, you guys can go on to the live tab on the channel and go and check out my reaction. But we haven't had Matt on for it. But again, it's the Rafael Leao show, brother. Um, a goal and an assist. I think he was easily the man in the match for this. What have you been making of his form in 2024? He he missed an opportunity or two where he could have scored, maybe mm. should have laid off the ball to Chukweze as well. But all in all, despite that, he gets Milan another victory. Uh, just talk about his performance and anything else that you saw. It was a it was a top performance by him. Um, I've seen the player comps on the match circulating, which <laughs> Is always something I gravitate towards. I know you have to watch the games, but you know, getting that 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 small package of of highlights from a from a performance like Rafa is always exciting. And uh, you know, beyond the goal, a lot of the same you know things we expect to see from him, right? And you know, I find it interesting as you were mentioning, you know, Rafa Fiorentina, right? This is a kind of a match review preview. We're talking about some other things here. Rafa seems to do really well, at least over the past couple years, against Fiorentina. Um, he had the, I believe when Milan won 1-0 against Fiorentina a couple years ago in the Scudetto win at, at San Siro, I think that was the Mike Magnon assist to Rafa, and I think that was the goal. Uh, no, that one, well, in the home fixture, he stole the ball, basically. They yeah. were pressing. Um, Magnon didn't have that assist. That was against Sampdoria, maybe. Okay, Sampdoria. Yeah. But, Never the case, he had the sure, uh, in his basically his defining moment of the first season at Milan. He had that really great goal against Fiorentina to show people what he's capable of. Um, and you have a performance here where he gets a goal. I know people are gonna talk about the Terracciano's coming out and his goalkeeping and the lackadaisical defensive situation for Fiorentina, but I mean, he still had the great run to get in behind. Great pass by Tijani Reinders, who um had probably one of his top three performances of the season in this game. I think he. Um, really showcased all that Milan were hoping to get from him. And I know he's had some ups and downs this year. He's been in and out, um, you know, largely due to the fact that Ruben Loth is chic, Isma Pereser, Musa, a lot of players, Adley, have been coming into the equation, which speaks to the depth that Milan have had in this department. But he was really good in this game as well. And my final point um, on this, or my second to last point on this, is I think that you, you talked about, you know, Rafa's form. Um, and the form of Milan, for that matter, in 2024. Look at their two top attacking players, at least in my view. You know, Rafa's up there. And look at Teo. Both on the left side, Teo has been phenomenal in 2024. Yeah. When we talk about his assist in the Europa League, his assist in Serie A, his goal contributions. This is what Milan are capable of doing. They're capable of riding their two, you know, left-sided uh, offensive stars to mm-hmm. get good results. And I know Tayo didn't have that impact in this game. He was tweeting and watching the game. He was suspended, yeah. but you know, it just speaks to the fact that when these two guys are going in, in the right direction and their form is top, they can really, you know, galvanize this team and Milan can piggyback off that and get results. So uh, a really good performance overall to get the results um, playing against Fiorentina at their, at their yard is not easy, especially, you know, they had a lot of built-in motivation to get something from this after the untimely passing of Joe Barone. Um, But nevertheless, Milan get a 2-1 win here. You mentioned it, me, you, and Kush 
all had the same prediction. So we keep it pushing. Um, we also were able to get more distance between us and those behind us. You yeah, know, obviously, you were, you it's a great against Juventus. So yeah. a, a really good result. I can't really complain all that much. It was a big week getting the three points more on Juve after their yeah. last second loss in Serie A to yeah. Lazio. Um, really want to talk about Chukwese and get your thoughts on him. I have the statistics here on the bottom. He had the hockey assist on the first goal uh, mm-hmm. when Leao had a spectacular back heel assist. Obviously, it was just sensational. doesn't really matter. I saw people trying to critique that back heel assist. First of all, to pull that off in the first place is really difficult. And he fooled the defender because of it. Everybody is like saying that was terrible defense. No, it was such he a good pass that it completely exactly. fooled the defender that he was over committing to one side of the ball where he thought it would be closer to the face mm-hmm. of goal instead of yep. being behind him. That's just a great pass. And anyone honestly trying to argue it is, is silly. And then again, Leao also had a great pass to Giroud that the attempt was horrific. But yeah. again, I digress with that. But but again, Chukwese opens that up, looked far more confident, dribbling, ball-carrying ability, drawing fouls, really being active now. And you sort of kind of see this when things are going great for a player. You kind of see it happen in training too. I don't know if you saw the video with him and Mike mm-hmm. Manian where he's dribbling around Mike and basically crosses him up and scores on him. Just that, of, that infectious energy that he has right now is massive. Because when you have these fixtures later in the season, when you were playing Roma in Europa League, you have these difficult fixtures coming up in April, which have been very difficult and they will be difficult because it's Juve and Inter back to back. When you have someone like that, that allows Pulisic to rest a bit more, put him in the bigger fixtures, you know you could trust Chukweze in other matches now. And that's just great to see because his confidence is sky high. Um, I know it might be for some people too little too late, but nonetheless, there is an impact being made and at a crucial time in the season when Milan are vying for a trophy. And, and again, you mentioned it. This is a one-score game. You get those three points. Again, you start to distance yourself in the top four. By the way, top five for Champions League is still not a guarantee with the five spots. Mm-hmm. Um, again, your thoughts on Chukweze? Chukweze was from – he could have – you can make the argument next to Rafa – um, and Tijani was, I mean, I know Magnon too. Right? I mean, there's a lot of players that stood out in this game. This yeah. was vintage Magnon. But yeah. from an attacking, st- attacking sense, and really in the first half, Chukweze was showcasing everything that we thought we were getting when we acquired him, right? He was running at defenders, dribbling by guys, taking guys on 1v1, and then putting those dangerous passes into the box. He actually could have had a goal in this one too. He was literally right in front of the goal and tapped in territory. Yeah, the header as and well. the ball never came in from Rafa. But – Rafa, Rafa went for the for the attempt. And, and to be honest with you, I want to see Rafa be aggressive in that area. He does all the hard work a lot of the time to get into those zones. I want to see him go for the – now, of course, the smart pass would have been to Judge. Jukweze sitting right there probably would have been great for him to get a goal. But beyond any of these stats, Jukweze, I just want to see Jukweze being expressive the rest of the season. I want to see him running at guys. I don't want to see him being – you know, very passive and just be like, uh, let me get rid of the ball. Like like a lot of times what we saw with, with the, the Catalan last year where he was afraid to make a mistake. And there were moments this year with Chukweze where, you know, he was playing very little off the bench. Um, he wasn't getting that opportunity and that burn to have like the substantial amounts of minutes to kind of assert himself into a match and to get rolling. It's a different mindset when you know that, hey, Chukweze, you're starting this game a couple days in advance in the buildup, training, all the preparation, all the work that goes into getting ready. And he was up for the occasion. And really over the past month, this is something that Franco um, um, mentioned on the uh, Milan Weekly pod, which definitely go check them out. I listened to them and uh, separate. It's a kind of my rotation for podcast. Vintage uh, TVP. Yeah. yeah, no, no, they, 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 they're all, they're all entertaining. They covered a ton in their recent episode, but Franco mentioned like over the past month, we've seen, Chukweze really start to come on strong. And look, you mentioned people might say it's a little too late. Chuk- uh, Pulisic had most of this year. You know what? Maybe there's a part in the season where Pulisic, you know, look, he's taxed. He's taxed. He's putting on a ton of minutes. I know he's put up really good numbers, but he hasn't been able to play this many minutes in a season in a very long time. So there's that luxury where you're like, you know what, Pulisic? We'll give you 15, 20 minutes off the bench in certain yeah. games, maybe. We'll give you half a game against certain opponents. We want to make sure you're ready for those Europa League games. We want to make sure that you're 100% in, in all in for those matches. And then you have that luxury that you can put Chukweze in for 60, 65 minutes, and you're going to get these types of performances and this type of threat from him. 
So a really good job by him. Uh, it's it's great to see guys like Okafor and and Tukweze really join yeah. in with Pulisic for newcomers having you know an impact in their first year. And it, it really bodes well for what we could have next year, right? Where all this conversation yeah. about striker, this position, that position. If you're having Rafa, if you're having Chukweze, Pulisic, and you're having all these guys being able to produce and give you top performances more oftentimes than not, you add a striker in there. I mean, it really expands the way we're able to go at teams and the way we're able to, you know, um, produce goals. So it, a really good performance by him. And, um, you know, it's it's something that he can definitely continue to build off. Yeah, and again, talking about building off of that goal versus Verona, maybe if Pulisic doesn't get those hundred and what two, one hundred and twenty minutes or whatever it is, even against Jamaica and then against Mexico, he played two hundred yeah. minutes. Pioli rewarding with confidence, something yeah. that we kind of didn't see too often with Chukwueze when he had decent shifts and he doesn't kind of play for quite some time. At mm -hmm. least that consistency is starting to settle in. And as far as next year goes, and you mentioned it. The rumors are hot right now with Joshua Xerxes. How about that for a transition, right? So we're basically sitting here wondering what Milan's budget would be. It looks more and more clear the further that they get into Europa League. If they get past Roma, knock on wood, they're already moving even closer to uh, certifying their spot into the Champions League for next season. That's some serious coin there. You have some players that are going to be, to be sold. Obviously, CDK being the headliner for that one and a couple others, others that they can collect on. Um, Alexis Salamaker is being one of them, potentially involved in a Joshua Xerxes deal. The valuation has been rumored to be around $50 million. Again, we provide you with the link to the video on our entire thoughts on Joshua Xerxes. But the rumors continue to grow. Where there's smoke, there is fire. And Milan do need a striker if Giroud is leaving for LAFC. Are you still fully convinced? Not, I would say, fully convinced because you never fully were. But are you growing more and more confident that this sort of deal gets done? Because I haven't seen many other clubs be interested as Xerxes as Milan is and see that kind of fit happening. I think, you know, negotiations and the way Milan have handled um, business feels a little bit different under this new management. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's worse. I just think that when Milan's in, at least over the past couple markets, when Milan have earmarked the guy where they seen a guy they like, and he's kind of within their range, I feel like they really do a good job of laying the groundwork for a deal to happen. And what I mean by that, just to add on to it, is they've looked at Xerxes for a while. I think they've liked him for the since the very beginning of the season. When they saw what Bologna was putting out there, they're not just all of a sudden now going into Xerxes and saying, hey, Bologna, we want a deal. I think they kind of lay the groundwork. They start to kind of get their ducks in a row, and they say, what's our figure for him? realistically, we know we have this Alexis Solomakers loan with them with an option to buy. I think it's at like 10 million. Maybe right. that's not the number that you know, Bologna would agree to pay. But as compromise, as part of a deal, they say, hey, look, Solomakers played well for us. If they make the Champions League, they're going to get a little bit more money there. So they're going to be willing to get players that have that continuity within the team. And Tiago Mota, it's interesting too, just a sidebar with Alexis Solomakers. Tiago Malta seems to really like him. Pioli really liked him. There's just something about Alexis when he goes to a team where it's not just a numbers guy. I feel like he's a good morale guy, a good team team building guy. And he's he has some moments there, like he had that great goal um, in the in the win over Salerno Natana. So I think that Bologna likes him and they would like to bring him back. But I think it's going to cost still upwards of around $40 million maybe with Alexis Salamakers. Now, the question becomes it, it not necessarily – you know, is that a fee that Milan would be willing to pay? But I think, is that a fee Milan would be willing to pay this summer based on what they did last summer to get themselves in this position, right? Because we talked about last year, right? They sold off one of their cornerstone players in Sandro Tonali to yeah. fund that market, to build a more of a numbers type uh, team here where they have depth in multiple areas. And now they have the luxury going into this summer where if they say, hey, look, we need to move the needle. We need to get a player of that next caliber, of that next grade in the attack. It's maybe not being two or three of them. It could be just a matter of us getting the one. And the one would come and should come in the striker area. So I think, if look, 50, 50 million is a lot. That's Milan breaking their club record fee for him, right? That's where the market's going. Correct. I think if you're going to do it, you do it this summer. 
And I think that Milan have really shown, at least if you believe into the reports and you believe in sort of you know what they're saying regarding that Zerti wants to stay in Italy, and you look at that, we haven't really seen many connections to leagues outside and things can change. But I think that there's there's a clear fit here. I think Milan definitely do like him, regardless if it's Pioli, regardless if it's a Malta, looks like it's going to be Pioli. And I think that's a player that starts to fit into this <clears> team. <throat> and now you start to go through the sort of your prospects of what he looks like in your team. And I think it just kind of by the day makes Milan fans that much more excited for it because they know he's such a difference maker for what Bologna are doing this season as possibly a Champions League uh, qualifier. Yeah. To, to me, fees are fees at this point. They're always going to be inflated, yeah. especially at the number nine position. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're going to get into a bidding war with anyone. If they get into a bidding process, they have their be, number. They've always had it, their it might it might be against themselves. I don't think they go above anything with 50 on this player. Um, not a chance. And that even means like 50 and then solid makers on the side. There's been reports that they want the two deals separate, but regardless, you're still getting the money. It's all the same at the end yeah. of the day. But what do I know? Right. Um, for me with Xerxes, lovely player, quality on the ball. And again, we mentioned this in the video. Is he quite the number nine that Milan need right mm -hmm. now? I still don't believe that. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately for Milan, they do have some money to play with. And almost every single top reporter that follows the club um, closely as their job will tell you that they're putting aside at least $50 million for the striker alone, which falls into line in what we, we've said for months now uh, in the fact that they're paying large lump sums for players that have a strong future here. They're going to plug in the major holes now. It's going to be opposite of what happened last summer, um, and people should be anticipating that. It's going to happen at the number six, potentially right back, and obviously um, with their center back as well. So we'll see what happens. I ultimately think Xerxes is going to be that guy there with the growth decree again. We mentioned this time and time again. That hurts Milan hunting the mm -hmm. international market. I do, yeah. however, only see a second player um, being Jonathan David because of price, because of profile, and everything that they do. Um, but Joshua Xerxes is looking more and more likely that he is there. I would only say it changes if a club outside of Italy comes in with an offer just as strong, mm -hmm. maybe even more that Bologna can't say no to, but it's not going to be Bayern because they're not going to be able to flip him for the number of $60 million or so. But there could be some stuff like that. And again, guys, don't always get wrapped into this ideology of that Milan have to spend the 50 within that summer. There could be deals like Davide Fratesi with Inter and Sassuolo where, yeah. yeah, you pay some now and then you pay some later. We've seen Milan kind of do some of those deals in the past. I think there can be some creativity there. Ultimately, if you want to know more of our thoughts on Joshua Xerxes, click, click the link in the bio. Um, Matt, preview versus Lecce. Um, I'm going to pull up the lineup here. Obviously, there's that midweek fixture against Roma. This was the lineup that Milan fielded last time. So this will this will send you for a turn here. You have Pobega starting as the 10. There's Giroud up top as the 9. Leao Chukweze got his assist there. Krunic, you remember that guy, huh? Um, double pivot with Tijani Reinders. And the same starting back four um, with Manyan that we kind of had to start the year. This was the match in which, unfortunately, Yunus Musa had a couple of grave errors that cost Milan the lead in this. Mm -hmm. And one of those matches that ultimately has come to bite Milan in the behind in terms of yeah. the Scudetto race, despite Inter being so great. Um, your thoughts, what is your kind of personnel change here? Obviously, Pobega out. He's injured anyways. Krunic no longer with the club. Who do you slot into these positions and keeping in mind of this fixture against Roma midweek? Oh, it's tough, right? Because I think, you know, peep, some might say based on his goal production this year, you would say the logical choice would be Ruben Loftus-Cheek, but of course he's not available for this match. Correct. So that's kind of takes him out of there. Um, look, if you want to get creative, you you throw Okafor on there. Maybe you have him interchange throughout a match and he plays maybe as like a second striker off Giroud as a player that can run in behind and Giroud's more of a holdup player. Maybe that's a possibility. I feel that Pioli's going to go a little bit more of a not safer lineup. I think that's probably the wrong way to put it. But I think he's going to go more with a standard approach to how, how things have gone. Maybe he might go, you know, Adley, um, 
Tijani and then you know maybe put somebody else at a little bit more advanced position because I think that he starts to kind of see how he how would it, how his players are able to play in certain areas and would it really be such an issue that if you had based on the way he's playing Tijani slot in that number 10 role that Pobega was playing I don't think so I think Tijani has the capabilities to make those passes he showed it against Fiorentina he showed it in glimpses this entire season I'm not saying it's ideal but I think that when you look at the defense, that is really where I get more concerned because mm. you have some of these teams like Lecce, right? They were down 2-0 to us. They came roaring back, and I know that we kind of it shot really ourselves in the foot and we kind of inflicted that on that, on us. But at the same time, our defense that we didn't really talk about too much in the Fiorentina game, they looked they looked bad. If it wasn't for Mike Magnon's heroics, we might have been having a different conversation about that game. It could have been a 2-2, right? So I think that – this is the type of game where I think well, Milan have been playing well enough in the attack. They've been creating enough. Maybe they need yeah. to score more goals. Yes, we obviously know that. They create a ton of chances. That's not the issue with right. this team. But I'm looking more to that defense. I'm like, I'm looking for the defense. I'm looking for guys, like if it is Malik Chow, who didn't have the best of performances against Fiorentina, you really can't point to a single performance he's had since his return that gives you sort of positivity where you're like, all right, Malik seems to be getting back into form. I want to see our defense put in a good performance. I'd love for us to get a clean sheet in this one. Truthfully, yeah. if it's, if it, the midfield is average and Rafa has an average game, but the defense kind of says, we got you on this one. Yeah. They're locked down and we win this game without much stress and strain. I would love that. So that's really where I'm of sort of leaning to. So my question back over to you is if it's not Malik Chow and Tomori, who do you see as the parent? Or who would you like to see as that parent? We do have Tao back in there at left back. Sure. The suspension. We have Davide Calabria probably at right back. Who would you like to see centrally? Who gives it's you the Gabia. It's obviously Gabia. Yeah. Um, I think Gabia has kind of earned that. I would understand if some people maybe want to rest him, put him in, put him on for the Roma match. Yeah. It's very difficult at home for San Siro. You know, uh, Malik Chow has been very up and down as a player this season. Yeah. Um, I think maybe the yellow was a little bit harsh for him, but you mentioned, you know, players under duress. He was that headline yeah. player for this match against Fiorentina. Again, this is against an inferior opponent against Lecce. I think you keep rewarding a Gabia. I understand why he hasn't played as much. Maybe in the past couple of games, Chao has gotten back more mm -hmm. minutes under his feet. He's obviously got the greater potential, but Gabia also getting a rest because he's never played this many minutes in a system like this to keep him sort of fresh. Obviously the Kalulu injury did not help anyone. Kiera has been kind of banged up as well. So you kind of have to keep that uh, as a rotating door. I think you see more substitutes. I don't think you see either center back that would start this weekend, play the full 90 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So I would like to see Gabi and Tamori because I think there's nothing more important right now, especially when you get like a, a six day or five day break uh, in between. Um, and again, Roma with that massive match against Lazio, this is something yeah. we highlighted on our past podcast that they have a really difficult schedule here. This one is more important for them. Lazio kind of coming off that loss against, uh, 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 who do you call it? Juve in the Coppa Italia just, just yesterday or the other day. So, so that's a significant impact as well as to what that will happen this weekend. For me, I think you start Gabia. You keep it simple. He's been playing well. My question, though, is, however, this has been brought up, and now that Chukweze has sort of been playing well, you mentioned this number 10 position. Is it Musa? Is it Tijani Reinders? How about Captain America at the number 10 position? Try that out. Have Pul uh, Chukweze, sorry, out on the right. Maybe Okafor, Giroud up top. It really depends if they want to kill off this game early. And then you make those substitutions. But would you consider tinker tinkering with that sort of attacking trident up there? Because I think it would be very interesting because we know Christian can sort of play that number 10 position. And he's such a great technical player that he should be able to adjust. And, and seeing all three of these attackers on at the same time would just – it would just be a lot of fun. And it would be very interesting to see how that could develop. Because ultimately, if you have something cooking there, that could change your mind heading into the summer. But your thoughts? I'd like to see it. I mean, you know, I think they're, they're the three players, you know, they offer a lot of similar things, similar qualities, but there's also some differentiating play between them that I mm -hmm. think that, you know, in, within the system, um, given that it's been, you know, 30 match days, right, that they've uh, uh, experienced enough together as a team to, to coexist in a match. Um but I do feel that, you know, Stefano Pioli 
Um, he's got something good going here, I think, as far as results are concerned. He's getting Chukweze to play well. He's got Pulisic playing pretty well. I know Kush mentioned that he, you know, he's gotten the goals, Pulisic, or the assists, but he wants to see, like, a little bit more creativity, a little bit more, you know, um, impact from, like, opening up play and, and those sorts of things. So I think it might be too many, in my view, in a match like this. It might be too many cooks in the kitchen where I think, you know, ultimately – you know, you might get Pulisic kind of like shifting around too much. Rafa likes to move around throughout a match. He, he likes true. to carry that ball and move. So I think that might be a little bit too much. I think that if you go and give, you know, Pulisic, you know, a little bit more of an opportunity to play a little bit, get a couple minutes underneath him. I'm not saying completely play, you know, him or Chukweze in the 90 minutes. Right. But I think that now we're in, a, we're in a preservation part of the season where – we're in a good spot for our top four. We by the week we're patenting our, our distance between, you know, the other the others behind us. And Roma even dropping points as well against. And Lecce. Roma's dropping points. They dropped points on, on the weekend um, to Lecce, I believe, right? And Lecce, yeah, yeah, that's what I just Lecce said. Lecce had yeah, yeah. they could have won that game. They actually they had like twenty five shots. Twenty something chances. Yeah. yeah, they 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 had a ton. So I think it speaks to what Roma um, are defensively. So <laughs> I think with that being said, though, I think Milan. We'll go with a little bit more of a more traditional lineup in this game. And I think as the game progresses, if we get into a position where we're, we're comfortable defensively, the game's in control, then I think you might start to see you know, Pioli, yeah, hey, let's get Pulisic on there for 15, 20 minutes, maybe move him around. Like, you know, let's see if we have something here. But I think that, you know, this is a great conversation, right? We, we've talked about depth. We've talked about this the entire year. We weren't able to have these conversations last year. Okay. Right, not just last year, for a few seasons. The year before and the year before. And the year before. <laughs> I mean, yeah, ever since we started doing this kind of stuff. Um, prediction time, then, um, since we're hot, apparently. Uh, honestly, I'm going to go with a 2-0 Milan win here. Um, listen, Lecce are kind of safe from the drop at this point. It's all about these risks. And, and the very important thing to remember against these bottom half table teams is that this is all they're playing for at this point in the season. Yeah. So they have the week-to-week -week preparation. You saw them definitely gain some more confidence with that performance against Roma. It does yeah. not matter if Paulo Dybala was on the pitch. Roma still weren't playing that great. I think this bodes well for Milan just for these next two fixtures. Listen, they got the win against the Learning Tana. They're pretty awful. They lost to Elas Verona, um, the draw against Frosinone. They're not in the greatest of form. They've had a relatively difficult schedule. Milan should be able to take three points from this. And if they concede a goal, God only knows how they do it. Um, what do you think is going to happen in this game? And I, and I think Leao scores again. I think he continues this hot streak. I say 2-0 um, as well. Um, that was sort of what I had in my, in my head. I think that Milan, uh, I've been talking about, you know, Milan maybe not playing the, the, the most convincing football and making results a little bit harder on themselves than it needs to be. I think this is actually a match where they do play a pretty complete game. I think the key being defensively, um, they 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 play a little bit sharper. I think they have to. I think there's a lot of questions being asked about the defense. You know, there are those questions really aren't being asked about the attack. Pulisic's been really good. So Le Leao's coming into form. Teo's been very good. You know, Giroud's still able to do what he's able to do despite you know not being that mobile. And Okafor's coming on in two ways. So, like, Milan have had their attack where they need it to be for the stretch run here. Midfield-wise, we know what these players are able to produce. We haven't really seen, you know, um, you know even Ismail Benacer play much of his best best football. But at the end of the day, you look at the midfield, and you're like, all right, we can we have enough guys, enough numbers there to do the job. It's the defense. I mean, Milan really needs to start putting in performances that show that they can make a deep run in the Europa League. I think that's where the conversation sort of shifts, right? Because in Serie A, we're pretty secure at the moment. And Milan, have high, everyone's been highlighting their defensive issues and how many goals they've conceded, specifically in the second half of games. Milan have been ahead in a lot of these games, and they've really squandered a lot of the points that they see themselves sure. distanced by with Inter because of their second half performances, and that's come directly from the defense. So yeah. I think that Milan in this match, they really do need to put together a good defensive performance um, you sh you've seen Mike Magnon put, pull out really great saves. I know he had a couple moments this year where people were questioning him, him yeah. getting beat near post and not making the saves that people have expected him to make. Um, with all that being said, I think 2-0, I think we play better defensively, which I think is absolutely key because truthfully, Martino, if they're going to do anything in this Europa League, they have yeah. to start showing that they have at least a little bit more grit and a little bit more um, 
security yeah. defensively. Otherwise, they're going to get absolutely railroaded by and by right. Leverkusen. Um, and definitely, obviously, a Liverpool. The final could be a fair thing as well if they get there. Yeah, yeah, you're right, though. And you mentioned those second half stuff. Been better in the second half of yeah. this season, but that is not something you want to do against a Bayer Leverkusen, who, for all accounts, every single time that they go down and they're in the second half, they seem to get a game-winning goal in stoppage time from Patrick Schick. Um, speaking of adjustments, and we'll finish off the podcast with this because this has been another hot topic. Um towards the end of uh, these past couple of weeks here. Stefano Pioli confirmation for next season. He obviously has one year left on his contract. Many of us, uh, ourself included, thought that it would be best if the club were to part ways with the manager. But at this point, seeing some of the options at, on the table, what clubs will have managerial openings that are more desirable and lucrative uh, than Milan at this point in time, um, have the advantage over them. That means Barcelona. That means Bayern Munich. That means Liverpool. Uh, Manchester United more than likely. Um, so again, those positions potentially being open change a lot. So for Milan and Juventus as well, um, excuse me. So for Milan here, um, I don't see who they end up bringing in. Tiago Mota seems like he's sort of on his way to Juve. I don't think the Mota track is going to heat up. I also believe that at the same time, you're sort of not going to see a Vincenzo Italiano because of the way his style is, mm -hmm. um, and that's important. So we're talking about stylistically, personality, um, and just overall, you know, can you manage Milan, which is a very difficult job. Um, it is no easy feat. And Stefano Pioli here, I think he's had his flaws. I think there's been some serious negatives. I don't think that he should get an extension by any means. I don't think he's warranted that. He would have to finish closer to Inter in second and then win Europa League for me to even say he's worthy of that. I think as of right now, I think he's done enough to warrant one more year on the job. I think ultimately with the, the way this direction it's headed, finishing second in Serie A, worst case, I guess you could say semifinal appearance, or he gets knocked out against Roma this round. Um, Pioli looks like he's going to be staying next year at Milan. Do you agree with this? Um, you know, this is kind of a, an internal conversation I've had with myself as I've seen the sort of second half of this season progress. Um, and I know some of the people on Milan Twitter that are at staunch and the staunchest of purely haters are not going to like this. Not, uh, but I think this is kind of the right decision based on the fact that, look, he's still under contract for another year. I agree with you. I don't think an extension is warranted here. I think you have him under, under contract for one more year. You give him that year and you say, hey, look, we were, get, we, we were basically – ready to give you the ax after this year, but you come on strong. We're going to give you that last year to prove it. And if he does really well and Milan were to win a title next year in the league, then obviously I think, you know, the conversation becomes much different, but right. I think when you start to look at, you know, weeks ago, right. When it was Conte, right. Oh, Ibrahimovic had conversations with Conte and then um, Christian Falk, I think you know, said there was links to Antonio Conte and Bayern Munich now you start to see Thiago Mota you know, potentially getting into the Champions League with Bologna, that he could be going to Juventus. A lot of things have changed in the past weeks. I mean, Juventus haven't won a game in what they won once in the last nine. One in their last nine, yeah. Right? So I think that Juventus were in a position where they maybe weren't going to change their coach. But now they're starting to see themselves kind of creeping back into that conversation of missing out on top four for a second straight year. And now they're having to make a choice. So all of a sudden, the options start to dry up in an already pretty – thin coaching market yeah. right so now i i always throw the question back over there and again i i was in agreement with you right i thought that pioli you know his time was done this was the natural end of the cycle thanks for everything you've done but it's time to move on if you don't want pioli and i'm totally cool if you don't want pioli who who is the guy do you feel confidence with an italiano i don't it takes a lot to coach milan it really does. You mentioned it. It's a lot of pressure. Are you going to go hire an Italiano and give him a hunt? This budget, this team that you built, that you spent a lot on, are you going to give him the full market and the full backing? I think he goes Napoli anyways, but yeah. Right? And then you start going down the list of coaches. That like, There's been reports that Deterby might be leaving Brighton. But Dubai, then I've had people yeah. say that, look at the step back Brighton's taken this year. Do you have the confidence that he can handle Milan? We like what he's done. He, in last year, he was phenomenal. He was did some good things at Shakhtar too. 
But yeah. I think you start to kind of look at the situation and you start to be very realistic with it. And you start to think like, you know what? Milan might be in a position where they have to. They have to stick with Pioli. Yeah. And look, I'll be honest with you. There could be worse options. Pioli has, I mean, every single year You're he's right. coached, he's top four. In his defense, you have to look at the whole thing. I thought last year, yeah. You know, like <laughs> beside that, but we've played the Champions League every year. We've. It's just. I know just, people want to win not trophies. As many I options, totally get that. I, I know people want to win trophies, and I totally get that. But the names that I just mentioned, do you feel confident that taking emotion out of it, that they're the guy to get you a trophy? Is Italiano the guy who has never won a trophy the guy to get you a trophy to get you the scudetto? Or he's, Europa League or your Champions League trophy. He's, he's, I think he's done a good job at Fiorentina. Yes. I think that, that's yes. a really difficult situation. But yeah, it again, this is about Milan. And then people think that like Conte is just like a plug and like everything will just work. Yeah. They've, they've played a completely different system. They're not financially dominant. I, I think he would go back to Juve before he comes to Milan. Like in all honesty, like I, I just don't see the fit. And I'm tired of kind of addressing and having to talk about this on Twitter going back and forth and it's just it's honestly annoying to talk to people on there because people just don't simply grasp what we think will happen and what we want to happen what you want to happen is unrealistic what you think is going to happen is totally different what's probably going to happen is is pioli is probably going to stay mm -hmm. and if not they're going to hire a manager that is probably not at the top of your list so you think right. julian nagelsman you think a hansi flick you think uh, Antonio Conte is going to walk through that door and manage Milan, you are sorely mistaken. And I don't really give a crap if you want management or ownership to have higher ambition. They don't. They don't align, align with your views. So whatever you're saying is nonsense because it doesn't matter because it might as well get on FIFA and do that for yourself mm -hmm. because it's not happening to Milan. You have to understand this situation. You may or may not like where the club is headed, but the reality is this. They're probably not going to hire the manager you want, and they're going to go in a different direction, which probably means that Stefano Pioli plays, uh, stays. And as you mentioned, there's probably far worse guys to hire. Um, so with that, it looks like Pioli will Napoli. probably be staying. Napoli. I understand that it's a kind of a different circumstance, right? Sure. Spalletti yeah. won the, the title, and there is that row between him and De Laurentiis. It's hard to find a coach that – can get you continuity and stability and consistency. Talk about what they were before Spalletti, right? Let alone a title. Look yeah. how many years that Inter went through coaches before they got Simone Inzaghi. I know they had Conte, but look, Stramaccioni, all these coaches that they've gotten, it's hard to find a coach that can get the players to play to their potential, that sure. can get you consistently in the Champions League. Look how many teams are shuffling in and out of top four in, in Serie A. Look at that. They finished second last year. They finished you second last year. They fired their coach. They fired Zara. <laughs> well, he resigned, but resigned. But uh, whatever. But a video. Well, I was going to bring up Juve. Juve won nine straight titles. What has happened since then? You have Andrea Pirlo. You have Maurizio Sarri was before Pirlo. Yeah. You go back to Max Allegri, who is on his way out. You're getting a new right, manager. It's not now. easy to find a coach. Um, it is not easy. And again, I I would like to highlight this for people before we finish here. Um. Managers are very much like players nowadays, guys, right? They will go where the money goes. When Serie A clubs, okay, it's a little different when managers like Sari and Conte go abroad and Deserbi go abroad. When the top clubs are not calling your name in Italy, you might as well go to where the highest right. offer is, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's smart because guess what? A lot of these guys weren't the greatest of players. And even when they were players, guess where they were? They were playing in the early 2000s where you don't nearly make as much as some managers do today. So they're going to elect for those positions. Carlo Ancelotti is the poster boy for this at this point, right? So, so with that, you have to take in the context. Milan are still a few years away from being the club that you want them to be and probably one more ownership away from the club that you also want them to be. So I err on the side of caution because what you think the timeline should be for Milan is not in reality. And, yeah. that, and that's all I really have to say with that. Um, any other final thoughts before this weekend ahead, we should be able to record prior to Milan's match against Roma. Hopefully, we can get Wayne uh, on the podcast prior to to discuss those legs. We also will discuss Lecce. No post-match review for Lecce this weekend, guys. I apologize. I'm going to be working every single weekend for the most part. So, again, my apologies for that. Uh, but, yeah, any other final thoughts, Matt? 
No. Um, thank you guys for the support. I know this is how I typically end every podcast and same thing with Martino, but we truly do appreciate it. Um, uh, we read the comments. We see that you know, we have a lot of like a regular support group. There's a great community that we're building here. And that's uh, all thanks to you guys, you know, yeah. sharing the podcast, liking, subscribing, you know, you know, listening to the episodes on YouTube, Apple and Spotify and wherever other podcasts can be found. That is what drives us. That's what keeps this podcast growing. So we do truly thank you for the continuous support. And, um, you know, it just makes this much more enjoyable when we're able to do that on top of Neil, I'm getting positive results. So thank you. Yep. Um, and again, go follow Matt at Matt underscore St. Angelo and any Simil Ambrose that's been there this entire time. Myself at Martino Puccio and underscore Puccio. Um, again, go watch the Joshua Xerxes video that we have linked here. Um, again, go and check out that Milan weekly podcast with Franco from New York City uh, Club. Um, and then also with Stevie P and Vinny, those guys are classic. They're the best. Um, Coast to Coast with Fabio and Gio as well on the same YouTube channel, Milan Weekly Pod. Go and check out Kush's latest videos as well. We were there at the start of it in black and white. Uh, Kush does a tremendous job. He only continues to grow. So funny how I didn't even realize we were there for his 100th and 1,000th subscriber. I mean, the guy has just done fantastic. He's, he's nothing but humble and a good person. So we really urge you to support uh, people like that. Again, Sempre Milan as well, always one of the more consistent podcasts in the Milan community, if not the most consistent, uh, over 300 episodes now. And then Old Hard Rosonero, a good friend of mine, um, and um, what is it, our Calcio guys, uh, our good friends there. And Kicks to Picks, uh, again, if, if you like sports betting or any interest in on that side of the sport, go ahead and go and check that out. That's what our good guys, Nick, Steve, Scotty, uh, it's a great podcast. Um, can't really think of too many other things. Again, we just appreciate all the support here. Go and follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Um, TikTok is kind of uh, loose, not so loose. But again, comment your thoughts on Stefano Pioli, Joshua Xerxes, and everything else, and subscribe if you have not already. Thank you guys so much, and see you next time.